Welcome to the Life Self Mastery Podcast, where we bring in entrepreneurs who have created online businesses and improved their lifestyles. Here's your host, Rohit Malhotra. Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Life Self Mastery and today I'm excited to have Kate Stillwell, uh, who's the CEO of Jumpstart Insurance. Uh, Jumpstart is developing a first of its kind financial resource that helps individuals and families weather the economic shock, shock of a natural disaster. Kate has done a master's in civil engineering from Stanford and MBA from Berkeley. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thank you, Rohit. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So, uh, so you know, you, you've um, built uh, uh, two other quick related uh, organizations and now you're, now you're building Jumpstart. You know, what got you into, into this crazy world of startups? Yeah, I think that it really is a labor of love and it's sort of the natural trajectory of my career. I started out um, wanting to make the world a better place uh, as a civil engineer, um, making, designing infrastructure and in particular buildings to keep people safe in natural disasters and realized that there's so much more to community recovery and community resilience and having a safe world, so much more than just the built environment. Uh, the economic system and the social system are all uh, key components of being able for a community and for individuals to recover from a disaster. And so my work sort of took a, a slight, slightly different direction that um, meandered a little bit farther from engineering and more towards economic recovery. Got it. And, and, and the previous companies that you had founded, were, were you able to get the exits out of, uh, from, from both the companies? So both of those companies are still thriving. They are both nonprofits. Uh, okay. So uh, the exit question is not exactly the same for nonprofits. The first one is called GEM Foundation, G-E-M. It uh, creates earthquake data sets uh, that are scientifically defensible around the world. The second okay. one is called the U.S. Resiliency Council, USRC, and it provides building ratings for disaster resilience, like green building ratings, disaster building ratings. Got it. And, and, and what made you start Jumpstart Insurance you know, after both these uh, uh, non-profit companies? Yeah, so like I said, a, a bigger missing piece for community recovery, bigger than the built environment, is financial recovery. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, in California, as, the, as an example, and this is just one example that is uh, repeated throughout the world, um, nine out of 10 people have no form of insurance for earthquakes because earthquakes are excluded from regular insurance and has to be bought separately. But even worse than that, a majority of people, more than 50%, do not have savings that they could tap into in an emergency. And so what this means is that a natural disaster suddenly becomes a financial nightmare. So I was really motivated to find a solution that is accessible to many people um, in terms of, of, the, of uh, accessing their budget. Um, and affordability, but which also provides this immediate liquidity in, and when the worst possible thing happens and people need money the most. And that was the, that was the genesis of Jumpstart. And, but you, you, you're only focusing on California as of now, or, or, or are you also looking to expand uh, in other regions and countries? We started in California and we launched one year ago. And the reason we started California is that it's my backyard. And it's because um, it's where I have the most knowledge and the most credibility for being able to start something so new and so different. Um, it, it definitely does take somebody who knows something about the domain. Um, uh, not to pat myself on the back too much, but um, we started in California for good reason. But we absolutely have an eye toward expanding to other regions and to other hazards. And uh, you, you introduced a new product category, which is uh, parametric insurance. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, the claim is that you're the first company which is offering uh, such sort of insurance. So, so what, is, uh, what is parametric insurance? Thanks for asking. Yeah, I'm very excited about this new category of parametric insurance. So parametric insurance means a lump sum is paid right away after a triggering event. In particular, an event that has a piece of data or parameter. That's why it's called parametric. So this, it's, it's very um, counterintuitive to um, preconceived notions of insurance because the preconceived notions of insurance have this power differential between the insurance company and the insured person, whereas parametric, because of the public transparent data, puts the insured person and the insurance company on a level playing field because everybody can see 
who gets the money and why and when and how much. So in Jumpstart's case, it's a $10,000 payment that is triggered by the occurrence of a severe earthquake as defined by data from the US Geological Survey. Got it. So, uh, so the amount uh, is, is so. This is a fixed amount uh, and uh, of, of ten thousand rupees. And um, how do you how do you decide? You know what sort or who should get that sort of uh, benefit? Right. So everybody who is in the zone of severe shaking, as defined by a, a piece of USGS data called the peak ground velocity. So anybody who's in a peak ground velocity more than 30 centimeters per second, that's roughly equivalent, actually very closely equivalent to the red zone of the USGS shake maps. So USGS publishes these shake maps for every earthquake that occurs. They're color coded according to shaking intensity. And so the red zone is the, is the area that um, had the highest shaking intensity. And, the, and therefore everybody for Jumpstart's purposes, everybody in the USGS red zone is eligible to receive their $10,000 payment. Got it. And uh, yeah, so, so do, do you also, uh, uh, you know, does somebody has to pay an X amount of money every month uh, to be a part of uh, this uh, this particular benefit? Yes, it is an insurance product, <clears throat> excuse me, and people pay a premium. Um, the population weighted average cost is $20 per month. That varies by zip code, but it's pretty indicative of many places in California. Um, $20 per month and a $10,000 benefit after a severe earthquake. Got it. Okay, and, and you know, uh, 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 you know what is the uh, what is the target audience that you're looking at? You know, I uh, figured out that you know you are reaching out to B two C market, but you've also started uh, you know getting in roles into 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 B two B partnerships with other companies, uh, mostly as as an employee benefit. So uh, so who's your target uh, market when it comes to B two C and B two B market? Yeah, I think the interesting thing that we've seen in the past year um, is that uh, our customers are tending to fall into one of two categories, one of two segments. Um, one of them is uh, renters, uh, people who tend a little bit younger, trend a little bit younger, um, who maybe just recently moved to California, who might not be in Cal might not plan to be in California for all their lives, um, and who don't have a lot of savings built up, um, partly because of their um, age. Um, and maybe partly because of their lifestyle. And they, they, buy, they look at Jumpstart and they're like, this is a no brainer because um, I, I believe the earthquake is gonna happen, but I also believe in myself and, and, my, and I have this degree of self-reliance um, and all I need is uh, just a quick infusion of cash in order to be able to reinvent my life and, and just be able to um, make best use of a bad situation. <laughs> um, and so it's a, a, a sort of an attitude of optimism. And folks like this are also extremely comfortable making financial transactions online and expect their financial transactions to be seamless and integrated and technology enabled. So that's one customer segment. <clears throat> Another customer segment that's really interesting is um, folks who are more sophisticated about their finances, have bought insurance for many, many years, um, who are who are t trending to be homeowners and um, maybe a little bit um, older and more and more uh, as I said more more wiser um, and they are looking at it again from the perspective of savings uh, realizing that hey this is a way for me not to have to tap into my savings maybe my retirement savings um, when an earthquake happens because you know I'm old enough to know I remember earthquakes cause disruption and they cause all sorts of expenses that I can't anticipate maybe they already have their regular homeowners earthquake insurance and they see this as a, as a supplement or maybe they are maybe they've made the decision to forego the regular earthquake insurance and are seeing jumpstart as sort of that financial backstop and, and in your future, do you, do you look uh, more revenues uh, from, from your B2B partnerships? Yeah, so our, our direct-to-consumer channel is open and growing, and that flywheel is, um, is, uh, is, has its own momentum. Um, and we're, as you said, we're definitely looking for distribution partnerships, B2B partnerships, or B2B2C is really more accurate, um, through employee benefits. Uh, so having money in their pocket is, makes the employees much more likely to be able to stay after an earthquake rather than have to flee and, and, and move back to uh, their hometown, wherever that maybe it's from um, someplace outside of California. Uh, or maybe they just want to move away, even if they're from California. 
Um, and also, uh, it helps the, it's a, it's a great perk to offer the employees. You know, if you, if you offer your employees pet insurance, then you should absolutely offer them Jumpstart. Oh, okay, interesting. And uh, you know, I want to understand what are the customer acquisition channels you're using for for both B two C as well as B two B. And you know, uh, if you can tell the listeners, how do you get your first thousand users? <laughs> well, um, most of our customers in the B two C channel, I'll start with that, have been coming in through word of mouth. So we had an initial seed of customers, and uh, many of those people were, um, let's call them about 100 or 200 people. Most of them were people who knew me or know me um, and found out about Jumpstart at, during the journey. And then um, were so excited about Jumpstart that they told uh, their friends and family. And then, um, <laughs> so here's a classic story. There's a customer, they talk about it to their friends. The friend to, so maybe the friend signs up, but more likely or not, the friend doesn't sign up until the friend feels a small earthquake. And then the next morning, people are talking about it around the water cooler or at the coffee shop. And that's when the friend rem remembers, oh yeah, um, I heard about this company called Jumpstart. And then they look us up and they find us and then they sign up. And so that is um, absolutely the most common customer journey for getting this first, as you said, first thousand customers um, is this word of mouth cycle. So what we've been doing uh, for our customer acquisition strategy, at least for this phase of the business, is to really um, uh, make use of the word of mouth channel. And so give our customers ways to spread the word, produce content, um, uh, send physically mail postcards to their address so that they can give a physical object to their friends. Um, make a um, post information that is, uh, that is interesting to be shared. Um, and you might like this kind of a thing. Um, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, the first part of the first thousand customers. The second part is earthquakes are news. And so every time somebody feels an earthquake, they think about it, they talk about it, they look for things. So the other part of it is being findable. Um, and so I would say probably two thirds of our, of our new customers come from existing customers from referrals, and, but a full third comes from organic search, particularly after people have felt an earthquake. Oh, okay, interesting. And are, are you also looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, protecting people from, from hurricanes and tsunamis and other, uh, you know, uh, 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 disasters? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, we are uh, looking to expand. And in fact, that's a nice segue for me to introduce the fact that we have a uh, crowdfunding campaign currently open until November 30th on Republic. And the primary use of proceeds from that fundraise is to be able to fund expansion to other regions and other products. Hurricane is not at the top of our list because unlike earthquake, uh, hurricane is uh, covered um, as her, at least wind forces are, are tend to be covered under insurance, regular insurance policies and earthquake is not. Um, another, but one peril that is excluded, like earthquake is excluded, is flood. So we would be very interested in figuring out a parametric solution for floods. Got it. And uh, do, you, do you have other competitors in, in the same segment? And you know, how, how does uh, Jumpstart different, differentiate itself from other you know, digital insurance companies? Right, so um, there are a couple of um, startups that are trying to introduce a parametric insurance for consumers uh, in the United States. Parametric insurance for consumers is very different in other parts of the world, but if we focus just on sort of developed countries, um, there are a couple of startups that are trying to introduce a parametric wind product for Hurricane. Um, there is a startup that I'm very excited about that has introduced a parametric flood product in the UK for small businesses. Um, and, but, you know, I think of our primary competitor as being uh, savings accounts. If people have money in savings, they don't need Jumpstart. But that's good. That's a good problem to have. Um, you know, we want people to have savings so that they can have this cushion, this financial cushion to be able to uh, put to use in an emergency. Um, but in, large insurance companies are not uh, innovating on the parametric side, at least for natural disasters, uh, because it's um, they have their they have their core business, 
and um, parametric pushes the boundaries of regulatory compliance. Um, it is definitely a gray area from the regulator's point of view, and we were very careful to engage with the regulator early and often. But the uh, large insurance companies would rather have a startup take that risk, and then if the startup is successful, then acquire that startup rather than take that regulatory risk on themselves. Got it. And, and, and what is the what is the revenue model? Uh, and you know, if you can talk about. Uh, uh, you know, what are the approximate revenue numbers that you'll be doing this year and next year? Sure. So Jumpstart operates as a, an insurance broker. We do okay. not bear risk. Um, so what that means is our responsibility is to build the technology that enables this automated process of, of onboarding as well as the payment, the automated payment uh, disbursement. Um, we seed all of the risk to underwriters at Lloyd's. So we have an agreement with underwriters at Lloyd's. Uh, so they bear the risk and their responsibility is to make the earthquake, the post earthquake or post disaster payouts. Um, so that's a typical insurance brokerage model. And the, the business model for that is that the brokerage takes a commission somewhere between 20 and 30% and the rest goes to pay for the, uh, the risk. Um, and that's how we operate. Um, in terms of um, revenue, we are revenue positive. As, as I said, we launched a year ago. Um, took us four years to get there, so that's why I'm so happy that we're revenue positive. Um, and uh, we have our customers right now are in the in the hundreds, and we expect that to uh, balloon in the near future because we have a couple of B2B partnerships that are really about to um, to take off here. Got it. So, so, so what are you saying? Your revenue margins around twenty or thirty percent. Yes. Got it. And, and uh, you know, as you, as you mentioned that uh, you're using a crowdfunding platform like Republic. And so, so why, why did you use a, a platform uh, like Republic and rather than go, go to VCs and, you know, raise uh, a, a more amount of funding from there? A great question. I have a really good answer. At least I think it's a good answer, but um, which goes back to what I said earlier about um, uh, making best use of the word of mouth channel. As soon as we realized that this was this flywheel was happening, I realized, okay, the thing we have to spend our time on is gathering together a community who are motivated to spread the word. And so I met Chuck, the um, CEO of, of Republic, um, a few months back, and he said, you know, you should think about, if that's what you're thinking, you should think about crowd raising. And I said, well, we don't necessarily need the money. And he said, well, think about having a thousand people in your pocket. And I was like, oh, bam, light bulb, okay. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. So now we have 2,000 um, investors on Republic. And these are all individuals, this is our community, this is our small army of ambassadors who are motivated to spread the word and to keep that word of mouth referral engine going. And so I'm very excited about that, not just for getting the customers, but all the other resources we're going to end up needing in the future when we hire, um, when we want introductions to particular companies. We have this, this amazing resource of 2,000 or more people that we can draw upon. And that is so, such a treasure. Uh, interesting. And uh, do you have other investors um, uh, other than the, the platform uh, from where you're raising funds? Yes, we have uh, all angel investors at this point in time. And um, one, so a couple of those investors are from the Berkeley Angels Network and, um, and one corporate investor from among our partners. Got it. And, uh, 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 you know, you've, you've talked about, the, uh, you know, what are the money uh, to be used for, but uh, can, can you explain again about, uh, you know, where uh, I, I think, I think you already raised $350,000 on Republic and, you know, you can just talk about what, what is the money to be used for and when you plan to you know, get into other sectors. Right. As I said, the, the money from the crowdfunding will be used to expand the, to take, replicate what we've done in California here and take it to other places that are in need. I, you know, I, I can't count the number of times people say, can you, just yesterday I had a, uh, an investor saying, when can you get this for flooding in Kentucky? And people ask me, well, how about tornadoes in Kansas? And um, everybody seems to want this. Um, but our, our immediate next steps will be to continue the earthquake product in states that uh, also have an earthquake uh, hazard like California. Got it. And, and Kate, I was, I was uh, it's interesting to know why, why did you, uh, you know, create a benefit corporation than, than a normal, you know, you know C-Corp? 
Okay, that's a great question. So as you might know, a benefit corporation is a C Corp. It's just a variation of a C Corp with, the, uh, with one specific difference, which is that the board of directors is, has the option, but not the obligation to use as a decision criteria for their decisions, not just maximizing shareholder profit, but also the specific public benefit that's stated in the Articles of Incorporation. So our specific public benefit that we stated in our Articles of Incorporation is increase economic stimulus after a natural disaster. So for example, here's an example of a decision that we took um, in favor of the public benefit um, and the decision was early and it was, should we create a product that is targeted towards um, high net worth individuals that pays $100,000 after the earthquake, has a higher premium, we would engage with um, the existing insurance brokerage network um, and we might get some very, um, you know, very interesting set of early adopters and early customers, but the size of the market is relatively, really quite small relative to the mass market. Or do we create a product that is much more affordable, um, but only pays $10,000 and is accessible to really a wide ma mass market. And the, the reason that we made the decision is that in, in, if ultimately the, the smaller dollar amount product um, gets more money into the system, money to more people. Money to more people is, is fundamentally what that's about. And so it's a, it's a longer road to profitability, but it's also a larger market, much larger market. So it's a really a win-win. It's a, it, in the long run, it maximizes shareholder value, even if, even at the expense of the short run. And it also serves the public benefit of getting money to more people. Got it. But, but, but does it also mean that the investors can get an exit? Uh, uh, in, Absolutely. In a... mm -hmm. it's, it. it is a for-profit corporation. Got it, got it. I think I think one of the the more more famous uh, B Corps is that of Wabi Parker, uh, which is uh, you know generating a lot of wealth for uh, for for the investors. And uh, uh, you know, interestingly, I also read an article uh, of, which you published on Entrepreneur about uh, some of the worst moments uh, in your entrepreneurial journey. So, um, so you know, uh, 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 interesting in that article you talk about about a lender. Uh, and and how that uh, business relation didn't work out. So, um, so you know, uh, uh, do you do you want to talk about some of the bad moments which happened in an entrepreneurial journey? Because uh, you've been a, uh, you've been an entrepreneur for for for, for a very long time, and uh, you know what are the what are the uh, different risks? Uh, which which uh, there are a lot of in fact there are a lot of risks which comes of being an entrepreneur. But how do you recover from from such a uh, you know uh, from an event which can which can actually kill a startup? Yeah, I think that um, the you know the 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 difficult situation that I described in the article with entrepreneur was a result of my optimism, and so optimism is a double-edged sword, right? Because on one hand, it creates a blind spot, and so many entrepreneurs have the blind spot of being overly optimistic. But at the right. other, well, on the other side, um, optimism is what buoys us and is what keeps us going. And so, sort of to answer the very the very last question that you ended up with is how did I keep going? Is again through the same thing that actually got me there in the first place, which is this this unfaltering optimism uh, and belief in in what I'm doing and in what and what the world needs. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, if I had any any advice, it would be just to be aware um, of what your blind spots are um, and be humble about it and, and seek, um, you know, a second opinion or, or a different perspective that helps you see your blind spots, whether that's your spouse or your business partner or your investors, um, and really trust them because, you I mean, if it's a blind spot, it means you can't see it. <laughs> so. right, right. Yeah, very interesting. And and you know, uh, uh, being being an entrepreneur myself, I I I have this question: Is it important to be passionate about a problem or be obsessed about solving a problem? Because these two things could be could be uh, you know different at times. A lot of people, you know, uh, they they are passionate about about say you know playing an instrument, but it's very difficult to build a career out of it. But but do you think you should be passionate about a problem, or do you think you should be obsessed about solving uh, solving something? Well, I, I think we're, I, I actually think that's kind of splitting hairs. I think that what's important is to um, remember that it's not just a marathon, it's an ultra marathon. And that whatever it wakes you up this morning um, has to be 
the same thing or something similar is going to have to, it's going to have to continue waking you up um, at, at, you know, six years from now. So it has to be something that you're so, that motivates you, whether it's through obsession um, or through passion, um, that, that just continues to provide that motivation for much longer than you ever anticipated. Interesting. And uh, let's quickly do the top three. What's your favorite business book? The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Oh, interesting. And you know, if you could go back in time when you started working on Jumpstart, uh, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done something differently? I would have worried less about competition and, um, and just focused on, on what I do well. Got it. And uh, do you have any favorite online tools, for example, Gmail, Slack? I love Medium. It's not exactly a tool, but it's so rich and, you can, and it's so searchable. Okay, got it. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, what is the best way people can reach out to you and get to know more about the Republic campaign? The Republic campaign is at republic.co slash jumpstart. Uh, you can also follow us on social at Your Jumpstart. Your Jumpstart is also um, a domain name that works for us, yourjumpstart.com. Uh, your Jumpstart, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, uh, got it. Uh, thanks, uh, Kay, for coming on to the show. I really appreciate speaking to you. Thank you, Rohit. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Life Self Mastery Podcast, where we teach you how to start and grow your online business. For more information, visit Rohit's blog at www.lifeselfmastery.com.